So I want to welcome you all to tonight's uh, event, Breaking the News at the Launch Debate. Breaking the News is an upcoming British Library exhibition opening on the 22nd of April in London and is supported by Newsworks. The exhibition explores what makes an event news, press freedom and issues of trust through a selection of news stories spanning 500 years of news production in Britain. This evening, we're in Leeds Central Library to celebrate the opening of the exhibition in public libraries across the UK through the Living Knowledge Network. The Living Knowledge Network explores new ways for libraries across the UK to work together to share ideas, spark connections and create memorable experiences for library users. Public libraries are drawing on their individual collections and regional connections to augment the exhibition to celebrate the value of regional news in communities across the UK. Each has been specially designed exhibition displays generously supported by the Helen Hamlin Trust. There'll also be a programme of in-person and online events curated by local libraries, which can be viewed at livingknowledgenetwork.co.uk. We're streaming online as well as into our public library partner buildings tonight, so a particular welcome to audiences in Cambridge, Jersey, Surrey and Ipswich. Those watching from afar can join in the conversation tonight by asking questions. If you'd like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag Breaking the News. We're delighted to be coming to you from the Tiles Hall in Leeds, which was originally the main library reading room. And indeed, when I worked at what is now Leeds Beckett University in the early 1990s and came to meet professional librarian colleagues here, this was the commercial and technical library. The choice to work with Leeds tonight reflects the British Library's strong presence in West Yorkshire. Our Boston Spa site has been in operation since the 1960s, our growing culture and learning programme in the region, and our current exploration to establish a permanent venue in central Leeds. This event's particularly appropriate as our news collect paper collection is the only part of our collection wholly housed at Boston Spa in Weatherby. We're thrilled to be joined by artist and activist Rachel Horn, editor James Mitchinson, and writer Roger Lytolis for tonight's panel event. They'll be in conversation celebrating regional news and its significance at the heart of communities. The event's hosted by Fatima Manji. Fatima's an award-winning broadcaster and journalist who anchors UK's Channel 4 News. She reports on major national and international stories and is best known for breaking stories with global impact. She's also the author of Hidden Heritage, Rediscovering Britain's Lost Love of the Orient, which was published last year. So, Fatima, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. A full house. Um, live in-person events are, uh, have been much missed, and so it's really, really nice to see so many of you here in Leeds tonight and to be in this fantastic, fantastic venue. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panel, and hopefully we'll have... Uh, a lively and an interesting discussion tonight. We're here to celebrate local journalism, but because we're journalists, we'll probably do so in a critical uh, way. So uh, let, we'll have a, a little bit of a chat and then we'll bring in um, some questions and some thoughts from the audience too. So first of all, we have here Roger Lytolis. Roger is the author of uh, a brand new book called Panic as Man Burns Crumpets, The Vanishing World of the Local Journalist. And his book is available to buy uh, at the very end, so please do seek that out. Uh, the book has been described as laugh out loud funny, uh, and his honesty has been praised, and he's promised me he's gonna be, be very honest and very funny here tonight. So I'm really looking forward to that. And it's obviously based on his many, many years working in local journalism in Carlisle. Then we have Rachel Horn, and you might have seen Rachel's work uh, upstairs. Uh, she led the Doncapolitan magazine, a citizen-led journalist movement advocating and celebrating Doncaster. She's also done lots of work for The Guardian uh, looking at issues in Doncaster, and so we're going to talk about some of that tonight. And then we have a gentleman some of you may know, the Yorkshire Post editor, James Mitchinson. He says he's passionate about God's own county and he fiercely fights for the North. So we're going to hear some of that fierceness tonight, I hope. So welcome, all of you. Um, I'd like to open with asking you 
you you all work in local journalism in different ways. What do you think is the best thing about being a local journalist? I mean, I started my career in local radio, and for me, the best thing was the closeness to the audience. When you did something right, you'd hear about it, and when you did something wrong, you would definitely hear about it. So what's the best thing for you about being in local journalism? Roger. The best thing, yeah, is, is the people. Um, the worst thing can be the people as well. <laughs> um, but the variety of people that you meet, the stories that you hear, um, the trust that people place in you to tell their story, they can come to you in times of, uh, basically, when, when time's really good or time's re really bad, you tend to meet people at one extreme or the other, which is one of, one of the things that makes the job so interesting. Um, I, I love to tell stories, so hearing stories, telling stories, Seeing the variety of life, uh, that's really the, uh, the best thing about it for me. Brilliant. Rachel? Um, yeah, I think for us, um, obviously we're, we're not journalists, we were artists that so started Doncopolitan. Um, but I guess for us it was the relationships we built with the community and the trust and the fact that we were doing something positive when a lot of national news had negative um, stories on our town. So it, it, was, it was a pleasure really to be of of service to the town in that way, even though it was incredibly difficult creating a print magazine in such a decline <laughs> of print. Um, but yeah, it was always like a, a privilege. And yeah, when, when things did go wrong, people would tell you about it as well. So <laughs> uh, it was interesting navigating that. James. Um, it, it depends slightly on where you are, I think, in the newsroom and what, what your job is in terms of what, what the best bit is. So. Uh, setting out as a trainee journalist, um, some of the jobs you're asked to go on um, are um, terrifying. You know, your editors will tell you that if somebody's been killed in a car crash, you need to go and knock on that door, talk to that family and tell their story. And the, the privilege in that moment is when you look the person in the eye and they welcome you into the house and they sit you down with a cup of tea and they tell you their story. You know, and, and <clears throat> excuse me. The, the reason they do that is because they recognise the Yorkshire Post, they trust the Yorkshire Post, uh, and as you say, some some media outlets aren't necessarily there to to give give them a positive experience. Um, <clears throat> but as you sort of as I've progressed in my career and become the editor of the Yorkshire Post, um, at risk of sounding sort of cliched, um, making a difference to the, that community mm. really is a buzz. So. Um, Anybody who reads the Yorkshire Post will remember a quick story of uh, uh, an elderly couple had been conned out of their life savings. It was about it was only fifteen thousand pounds. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a, a king's ransom, but it was to them. Um, and I remember putting an appeal in the Yorkshire Post, and within twenty four hours, we'd raised all of their life savings back and given it back to them. And that's quite special. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. I mean, you all, you all talked about trust in your own way. How difficult is it to keep that trust? Because sometimes things go wrong, don't they? Roger. Um, I think it's getting harder now to, to, to keep trust in general um, with the rise of, of online journalism and the rise of, of clickbait. Um, I think newspapers that have had good reputations for a long time um, if they're now being driven by the need to get as many people to click on their stories as possible, which leads to misleading headlines and uh, celebrity news and basically discredits the whole brand, as it were, I think that's quite a danger when it comes to, to trust. Um, so individual journalists are generally still very... Um, you know, they still recognise the importance of... Of, uh, of, of their work and doing it well, but if, if a policy from above is right, let's put a headline on this story that isn't really true to get as many people to click on it as possible, mm -hmm. then that has a very damaging effect, I think, on, on, on trust. And that's one of the things that's um, causing journalists in general, journalism, <coughs> to have quite a you know, bad reputation. Yeah. Rachel, you found that people were, were sort of distrustful because of stories that had come out about Doncaster and the national media. Just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I think my experience personally has been quite negative because um, I feel that 
because of Doncaster in its history with like the miners' strike and um, and then the post-industrial era was like quite a stereotype and journalists would come in, take sound bites sometimes and then you'd feel kind of misrepresented and I think for us we always felt that yeah that there is that narrative there but there are other things happening and we wanted to be able to create a publication that platformed that and platformed the change. Um, so yeah, I mean for us in terms of building trust within the community that was really difficult and one of the main things was that that we might stop publishing or we might stop existing because things are like a flash in the pan and things come and go and stories come and go so for us it was about maintaining a relationship even though the magazine evolved into being online or we did other projects so it was like being a, a brand within the community that kind of continues and hopefully will continue. Mm. And James Rachel is quite explicit about the fact she's a sort of advocate, a campaigner for Doncaster. Do you see yourself the same way for Yorkshire? <coughs> I think so. I, 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 I probably didn't set out to be, um, but through various different sort of conversations, I, I, I found myself sort of increasingly passionate about the Yorkshire Post, increasingly passionate about Yorkshire. I've been the editor six years. I've been uh, in local journalism 20 years in October. Um, I'm from one of those mining towns. I'm from one of those left behind communities. Um, the friends I went to school with, <coughs> excuse me, um, don't necessarily have um, good jobs like I have. You know, we didn't all have amazing opportunities, and I, I probably carry with me the just a sort of wish that everybody had the same opportunities in life, and that it wasn't a postcode lottery in terms of whether you could succeed in life or not. You know, it shouldn't matter where you're born or where you're from. We should all have the same opportunities in life, and uh, I sort of tried to steer the Yorkshire Post with that with that ethos. How do you get that balance right, though, if, if you're sort of campaigning for a place and yet at the same time a lot of news is negative and you're having to report difficult things about the community you're in? How do you get that balance right? It's a great, I mean, it's a great question. The first thing you have to do, and my old um, grandmother used to say, uh, there's two ears and one mouth, and, and that's the order that you should mm -hmm. use them in. So listen more than you speak, um, read more than you write, and, and that's really important that you take the temperature of the readers and the place to understand whether or not you're just looking like a demented, chippy northerner or whether you are actually tapping into what people want. Uh, and and that's, that's difficult in itself. Um, and sometimes campaigns about railway lines, you know, they're boring. Um, <laughs> And that's, a that's a difficulty, isn't it? It is, yeah. and it's really difficult to bring to life that huge infrastructure projects like that that can have, um, you know, detrimental impacts on the environment, on, um, you know, the landscape. Um, trying to humanise and bring to life the, the opportunities and the prosperity and the, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the jobs, for want of a better word, that those things can bring is, is, is tricky. But it, it is the secret, well, I say the secret, but... Um, the trick is to, to listen and tune in to what people are, are wanting. Mm. Roger, what do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I come at, at it from a slightly different perspective. I'm a feature writer rather than an editor or a news reporter, so my priority was always just to tell good stories. That was what I was driven by. Um, if along the way something that I did helped somebody, if it helped to raise awareness of someone's plight or to raise awareness of an issue in a community that was great but I just wanted to tell, tell stories I mean my colleagues were kind of more driven by that by that kind of thing than I was you know they would work very long hours um, they would go the extra mile to, to, to dig out dig out stories and um, it's something that I kind of admired rather than you know I kind of wanted to be that kind of journalist in a way but I was more tell a story and if it helped people along the way that was just a, a happy kind of byproduct really mm. Rachel, you feel quite strongly about who gets to tell a story. I know when you worked with The Guardian, that was, that was something that you talked a lot about. Yeah, because at first um, it felt very much like I was going to be the subject of John DeMoco's film and that he actually documented me expressing those feelings. So then that m 
through that process he said would you like to co-produce this film so I had a lot of autonomy on what we talked about who we talked about and I tried to steer the film in a way that kind of sort of portrayed a different side of Doncaster and just explain for, for those who haven't seen it what was the film about and what did it involve um, so the film was called Made in Doncaster and the idea of the, the film was to look at towns outside of um, sort of in the north that are misrepresented and to kind of dig into the issues of what it's like in a town that's been post-industrial, heavily by austerity. And when John first met me, um, he actually came to a, an arts festival that I was organising and I felt like he was going to like come and and um, like make a film about the the event but actually it became this completely different narrative and then we had the pandemic so um, he couldn't even be in Doncaster and I ended up shooting a lot of the film on my phone with no experience of video journalism and then involving a lot of other creatives which produced the, the film basically I feel like we've got quite serious already <laughs> I'm going to ask you to share a weird or fun story that, that's happened along the way when you've been local in, in your course of local journalism. It can be recent, it can be from years ago. You, you take your pick. James? They happen every day. Go on, just give, us, give us a flavour. Um, if, if I can go right back to... Um, it, it isn't necessarily a funny story, but it just... You said previously, what's, one of the, what's the best thing about journalism? And, one of the best things about journalism, it really does keep you grounded. You know, there's no chance of you sort of believing your own hype sort of thing. But I remember um, a, a story uh, that, I, that I discovered. It was, a, it was an elderly lady. Uh, I'm going to have to be careful with my, my words here. She'd been mugged of her bingo winnings. She'd been to the bingo. She'd been mugged of her bingo winnings. And I, I went to tell her story. And I think I'd only been doing the job six months. I said to her quite naively as a 20-year-old journalist, you know, if you met if you met the guys, is there anything you'd like to say to him? <laughs> oh, God. And she, she said, um, I'd like, I tell you, she had no teeth in, so she said, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. <laughs> uh, put my knitting needle on the gas and I'll shove it up his what's it. <laughs> I said, is there anything you could give me that I could put in the paper? And she said, put that in your paper. And she chased me off. Um, but, and that's one of the, you know, the great things. You, you deal with real people in real circumstances. Uh, and even in a difficult moment like that, somebody was able to sort of you know, find some humour. And um, I think that's one of the things that keeps you hooked because you don't get paid very much in local journalism. Yes. Um, and, and that sort of um, that connection with people, mm. it really it is addictive. Mm. I want to come on to, to questions about pay and, and money in a minute. But Roger, you've got lots of fun stories in your book. Just share one mm. of them with us. Naked swimming. Um, British Nature Tourism began a nude swimming session at a local pool. So I thought there's a potential for a good feature there. So I contacted them and said, would it be okay if I come along and report on this naked swimming uh, session? And they said, absolutely fine, as long as you take part in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, I knew there'd be a good feature in it, so that kind of tipped the balance. I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it, no problem. <laughs> it was about a month, it was in about a month's time, so I thought maybe the world will end in a month's time, I won't have to do it, but unfortunately I woke up and we were still here, so I had to go and <laughs> do some naked swimming. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, actually, it, 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 was, it was okay because I realized the most embarrassing thing was kind of being the odd one out, because I, I walked into the pool area with this huge towel around me. It was basically just wrapped around me like a blanket. And everybody else was completely starkers. <laughs> so I felt really awkward. So I just dropped the towel and felt less awkward, strangely. <laughs> so that's not the kind of thing you expect to do when you go to do your day's work. But it can happen if you're a journalist. Another one, I was interviewing some, some male strippers. There's a theme here, isn't there? Um, <laughs> and in a dressing room with male strippers. I better not dis describe what, what happened right now, but <laughs> again, things you don't really expect on a, when, when you go up in the morning. Uh, I mean, yeah, as, as James says, I mean, I think any, any long-serving journalist will have hundreds of stories. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're dealing with people at their, their best, their worst, and, and their weirdest at times. Sometimes, you know, you seek people out if they're doing weird things because you know that it's, 
it's going to be interesting. Um, so that one, again, one of the great things about the job. Rachel. Um, yeah, I, I just instantly thought about a story we did uh, on a man called um, Frank Lawson who collected bricks. Um, and he was a pensioner and his, his son told us that he'd like raid building sites for like broken bits of brick because um, obviously we've seen bricks sometimes have like names on them but there's like really rare bricks that have like little motifs on them and Frank had this huge huge collection and we just really wanted to write a story about him and his antics he actually had like an Instagram and he, all the bricks were on there as well so What's the handle? I'm quite tempted to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about I'll send off ideas. You will look it up for me. <laughs> so let's talk money then, because that, that's, that's been coming up. And, 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 it, and it is the, the difficulty here, because we can celebrate local journalism, but in the end, someone's got to fund local journalism. What is the biggest challenge at the moment, and, ha and how are you finding new ways to sort of continue doing the work that you're doing? James. Uh, I'm in, in danger of getting a bit profound here um, because people have to ask themselves the question what kind of local and regional journalism they want. Mm. Um, and you know, if I could ask for a show of hands, how many people in here subscribe to a local or regional paper? One. That's quite telling though, isn't it? And those local and regional papers are there for the community, they mm. do the fundraising efforts, they tell funny stories. Um, I've become quite fond of being a nuisance in terms of speaking truth to power. Um, we discovered a, you know, a story about um, uh, COVID vaccines being diverted from the region to the south of England. Mm. Um, and there was a night when several Tory MPs just you know, dozens of them called me out for the story. The next morning on Radio 4, a lead clinician confirmed the story was true. But she was forced to uh, change, change tack during the course of the days. Um, you talked about trust. Um, people in power don't want you to trust us. They don't want us to ask difficult questions. And the more people subscribe, the easier it is for us mm. to resist what Roger was talking about. The, yeah disingenuous journalism, the clicky stuff, the stuff that you know, there's an infinite amount of money in the sky that publishers can pull down by generating clicks. An indiscriminate paymaster who doesn't give a fig about your community and they'll never raise funds for somebody who's lost their life savings. Mm. Um, and if we can win the war on um, convincing people to subscribe, we can resist longer the temptations of, of Clicks for quids, as I call it. Mm. Um, and how are you doing that? How are you trying to convince people to subscribe? Well, some of it's enforced, so we put paywalls upon the website. Right. Um, um, but the, the best way to do it is to maintain your standards and to you know, keep coming to community events like this, where you talk to people about mm. the work you're doing, the journalists you have. Um, there are news outlets in Yorkshire that I'm responsible for, I'm not just responsible for the Yorkshire Post, it would go as far as Scarborough, Bridlington, mm. Whitby, Halifax, Wakefield. Some of those towns have one journalist yeah. filling a full newspaper and a website. And, you know, that's, that's really difficult. Um, but, yeah, as I say, I'm in danger of getting quite profound because society needs to question whether or not local journalism, journalism that's about the place they live and it's for the betterment of that place, whether they value that. Um, and I hope people do value that, and I hope we do prevail. Subscribe, you heard it here. Um, Roger, what's already been lost? Because the, we, we have moved from an era where people bought their local paper every day, they expected detailed reports about what was going on in courts, in, in coroner's courts, in magistrate's courts. We don't get that in every area now. It's just not expected in the same way. So what's already been lost? I think ideally a newspaper is kind of a watchdog for, for an area. Um, people know that they can, that it will represent them. It will, people can come to it and say, um, if they're having a problem with the, with the gas board and you, if you go to the local paper and they contact the gas board on your behalf, then things are probably going to happen a bit quicker than they, they otherwise would. Um, on a bigger scale, you know, the paper itself can be proactive and tackle MPs, organisations and, and push things. If you've got one journalist in a town, then that's not as likely to happen. 
I think financially the problem began with publishers giving away content online. Um, I think if people have had 20 years of free journalism, it's a lot harder to persuade them to start paying for it now. Um, I, I don't think this is hindsight, because many of us were saying this 20 years ago, that you know, why we charge for our newspapers, why, why would we give the same content away on the internet? Um, and and you know, we're kind of paying, paying the price for that now. I mean, I'm, I'm encouraged that there seems to be a recruitment drive now from some of the big groups, and uh, they seem to be cutting back on clickbait and going more for subscription models. I think, I mean, I spoke to a former colleague who told me that his paper, I mean, I, I better not quote the exact figure, but he said that one subscriber brings in the same money as many, many thousands of, of page views. So it makes sense economic, economically to make the papers better, make the websites better. So, so even a few subscribers will bring in a lot more revenue than countless people clicking on, you know, the new menu, menu from McDonald's or some celebrity gossip that's got nothing to do with with the area that you're covering. Rachel, you're trying to revive that spirit, aren't you, in what you're doing? And, and you, you, you went door to door handing out the magazine. 5,000 doors, I think you were telling me earlier. <laughs> so how, how did you do it? Um, we had a model where we, um, it was print, and we I basically went to local independent businesses and asked them to um, advertise with us, but nobody really got paid. We just did it for the, the, the love of it and the buzz, to be honest, like what you talked about. Um, and then we did other projects in the community to sort of like supplement it. So it was a bit of a crazy business model and I wouldn't advise anyone to do it that way. <laughs> but, um, but you made it work. We made it work and th there was something in that when we would go out into communities and hand out a print magazine and people would be like, oh, thanks, you know, like really looking forward to seeing this. We just totally buzzed off being of service mm. to our community. And I do think like it's a democratic right to have good quality news. and. We are not journalists, we're just artists that stumbled into kind of creating this solution and I, and I do think m maybe the subscription model is the way that we can kind of keep that. Mm. I mean, you are all making it work despite the budget constraints. What are you hoping to focus on to really keep the audience going and, and to make sure your readership knows that you're there for them? What, what's, what's the kind of focus, what's the sell? Uh, people in Yorkshire don't like anything being sold to them. Um, it, so I think the, um, the key is the relationship. Mm. Uh, and we, we're recruiting, in fact, there's a job ad going out sh next week, probably for the Yorkshire Post, um, an engagement editor, um, which is somebody who will ring people, talk to them, how's the Yorkshire Post, is there anything that we can do? Um, it, it, the key is that relationship. Mm. And, and I think um, if you think about, the, as I said, previously the indiscriminate digital paymaster and how that flows revenue into newsrooms. Uh, it doesn't care what content you produce as long as people click it. Yeah. Whereas if you engage with people and they see that actually you live near them and you use the same hospital they do and your children go to the same schools that theirs go to, um, by s sort of having that relationship, I think there is a chance that high quality local journalism that people trust um, can prevail. You, you mentioned, you know, democratic right there. Um, the Reuters Institute published some research recently that showed that um, there is a democratic deficit, i.e. people are disengaged from the process in communities where there isn't a local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And where there is a good quality local newspaper, people are more interested in the parish council, the town council, the city council, um, and they feel more compelled to um, be a stakeholder in those communities. Mm -hmm. When there isn't a quali high quality local newspaper, people lose interest and they stop caring. Yeah. And that's when corruption can occur. You know, when, as you say, when the watchdog's not there anymore, yeah. that's when, um, you know, basically bad people can do bad things. Mm. I do want to give people in the audience a chance for questions, so we'll move to that soon. But um, just before we do that, what advice would you all give to any young person or anyone who wants to work in local journalism? What's the best advice you would give them, Roger? I would advise them to, to kind of look closely at the industry. It's probably not what you might expect it to be. Um, it's probably not as much going out and talking to people and probably more cutting and pasting of press releases, unfortunately. That's depressing. It is, yeah, but 
It's, it's, it, in some cases, it's true. Mm. I mean, there is still great journalism being done. Um, the more funding people can give it, the more great mm. journalism will be done. But I would say go in with their eyes open. Don't expect it to be, don't expect it to be chasing around, you know, getting great stories on, on day one or possibly even year one. You might have to work your way up because depending on Elijah and which publisher you work for, some journalists rarely leave the office, which mm. is very sad, but people should know that before they go into the industry. But it, is, it can be an amazing job, both for the journalist and the community that they work in. So just I say, oh, oh, have your eyes open, but uh, try not to be cynical, even though there are things to be cynical about, but mm. try to keep faith in it, because it, it is still an amazing job. That is very honest of you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think it is possible to create like small grassroots projects like Doncopolla and if people feel inspired then they want to do that. I think it's, it's probably never going to be like a, a full-time job but other organisations do exist like Doncopolla and across the country that are doing really full, meaningful work that's valued by the community. Um, yeah, so I guess that it's not like... A, for me, anyway, it's not anything like what these guys do. It's, some, it's a different beast, but I think it still has an important impact in, in communities. So it's definitely worth doing or exploring. And to anyone who wants to try and set up something in their own area in the way that you have, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, build relationships with the community and, and yeah, find your audience in the community and work and co-create with them. Um, and yeah, have someone in your team that's got business sense. Because <laughs> 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 we didn't. We were just artists and we didn't really know what we were doing at all. So, <laughs> James? I'm always reluctant to give advice. Um, because I just, the, the, the people that interview the, the best are the people that are themselves and they back themselves and they believe in themselves and they follow the, the sort of path that they want um, so, so don't let anybody tell you the kind of journalist you have to be to be a success you know write about the things you're passionate about and the things you care about of course you know there are some formalities that you should try to get right try to make sure any courses you pay for are properly accredited yeah. um, seek some advice and have conversations with industry professionals write to the editor of the local paper you know I'll respond um, do you write back yes yeah, I, I can't write back to everything because my inbox is... Uh, I'm basically a switchboard operator some days um, with the inbox, but um, where p people write to me for advice and I can see that it's a young person, I try to help. Yeah. Um, but don't be straight-jacketed would be the advice I would give uh, any journalist coming through. and Be passionate about the things you're passionate about, write about those things, uh, and don't be afraid to tell editors, publishers, that you're more than just somebody who can read and write. You know, there's so much more to journalism now. Mm. Um, that if you can code, you can crunch data. Um, if you're a graphic artist, you know, if you can shoot and edit video quickly on a mobile device um, with great copy, great headlines, you know how to amplify things through uh, social platforms. You know, journalists are so much more talented than I was when I went into journalism now. So be yourself. Yeah, that's some good advice there. Thank you. So we've got lots of time for audience questions. I think there's a there's a microphone that's going to come round. If you could just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and I think there was someone at the back there already, just behind you. And if you could just introduce yourself as well, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hello. My name's Sarah Priestley. Um, so I. I don't really read many news articles um, personally because I feel frustrated with the amount of uh, subconscious bias that's often in articles that I, that I have read or do read. What training do you offer or do you think that, that journalists should experience to, to try to make them more aware of those different biases that they may be getting across in a very passive aggressive way. And can I just ask, is there could you give us an example of something that you've seen that, that particularly has made you angry about the biases? Uh, I think 
I can't give an example, but I think there's, there's, it's, it's literally embedded in virtually everything that I read. So there's obviously somebody that's very anti uh, Black Lives Matters, for example, or um, feels that certain political views are not in alignment with their own personal views. And, and there's often very little direct statements around that, but a lot of passive aggressive comments in embedded through the full articles. And I just find that, that really frustrating because I just see it so often. And um, I feel it's a form of brainwashing people that are, that are reading and subscribing to certain newspapers. So personally, if there was a newspaper that was willing to fully take that on board, and I would fully subscribe to that because it, I would feel I'm actually getting news rather than yeah. people's personal opinions embedded sort of through something. Okay, thanks very much for your question. James, why don't you kick us off with that? I mean, what do you do to try and keep the, the news side of things impartial? Because obviously you've got news and you've got comment. Pragmatically and simply, newspapers and their websites have to flag and identify opinion and commentary and editorial uh, and state that it is that rather than news. Um, but the, the lady's talking about something quite different. Um, subconscious bias is um, subconscious. We all have it. Um, how do you train people to, be, I guess, become aware of it is what you're asking. Um, the industry, uh, through the NCTJ, um, has long trained people uh, with a certain copy style. Anybody who's been through journalism training, as I have, will remember that a place called Oxdown, as I'm sure you do. Um, but there was a sort of a staid, stale, clinical way of writing copy. Uh, and that training was deliberately done to, to try to minimize subconscious bias coming through into news copy. Um, but subconscious bias that creeps into an author's work subconsciously um, is quite different to news organizations or newspapers or publishers who um, bake in structural bias to their work. And that's something quite different. Yeah. I mean, James, you recently had quite a controversial topic to report on, on in the Azim Rafiq mm. um, uh, investigation or scandal or whatever we want to call it. What, what were the sort of conversations you were having with your journalists about how to report that, the language that should be used? Uh, the, the conversations were um, about stepping back from the bad actors because there were a lot, and there remain a number of bad actors in that story who are feeding us lines that they want to see published. So they want to control the narrative, they want to steer the story. Um, and the conversations were about listening and trying to be aware of the fact that there are people who want to play you for their yes. agenda. Um, so try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, we had just on Saturday, we had a story um, relating to Azim's lawyer. He, he spoke to one of our journalists about Islamophobia uh, generally, uh, Islamophobia in government, um, the, the lack of... Um, willingness to tackle Islamophobia or even acknowledge that it exists. Um, that was our splash uh, on Saturday and um, it is imperative that we, we tell a 360 story, um, mm. but it's very, very difficult to tell who the bad actors are sometimes because they're very good actors. Mm. Roger, have you got any thoughts on that? The idea, I know with features it's slightly different, but with biases, I think in terms of bias, it maybe applies more generally on, on national papers. I mean, I think we probably know which papers tend to be left-wing, which tend to be right-wing. Um, maybe applies less locally because I don't think local papers can afford to be politically biased. They can't afford to, to alienate half of their potential readership. I mean, I know historically a lot of local papers were, were left or right, but nowadays you know, no local, no local paper can say, right, we're a Tory paper, we're a Labour paper, paper, and therefore tens of thousands of our readers aren't, potential readers aren't going to buy us because they don't like us. So I think the you know, bias is generally um, national and hopefully flagged up at least by the political banner that the paper goes under. Mm. Rachel, anything to add? Um, I think what 
question um, dialed up for me was around like who's in sort of like the newsroom and the editorial rooms, mm. it, how diverse are they, like what's the gender balance and how that might shift the biases because the different perspectives are bouncing off each other when they're shaping the, mm. the news. We always try to have a gender balance in Doncopolitan where we, we kind of split, um, so we had a split team and we, we always tried to work with different voices but we co-created our our work so it's very different to traditional journalism. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Back, yeah. We'll come to you next. Hi there, my name is Ella and I'm training to be a journalist at the moment um, in Leeds. Uh, my question is where do you go to look for your stories and I'm more interested in the unconventional methods and the unconventional stories. Great question, thank you. Um, Roger, you kick us off on that. I think it kind of gets easier the longer you've been doing the job because you build up contacts and either they contact you or you can, if it's a slow day, you can just go through your contacts book and think, well, I haven't spoken to so-and-so for a while, give them a ring, see if there's anything going on. Uh, that can throw up some, some great stories. Um, if you work in a newsroom, stories sometimes just arrive when you least expect them. Um, often people turning up in reception, for better or worse. Uh, that's kind of a, a bane of a lot of journalists' life when people just turn up and you know you hear this cry of someone in reception and everyone scrambles to be the person who doesn't go down to reception and meet this person because it's not always the best story in the world. Um, but sometimes great stories do turn up that way. Um, so contacts, people walking in off the streets, which is kind of old-fashioned, but it does still happen. Um, they're probably the main ones for me. Rachel? Yeah, pretty similar. Like people would come to us um, with ideas for stories and then we'd use that as a starting point. Um, but other times I, I'd use Facebook and sometimes mm. things would come up on Facebook and if we wanted to do something quick we might even just sort of like interview someone over Facebook and use that as a, a way to quickly make a story. It's not like <laughs> legit but what, this is just kind of like how we'd kind of capture things. Um, so yeah, that's sometimes what we do. Mm. James? Well, I mean, Facebook's a great place to start, but if you can get past the admins who are like Rottweilers with people who come into these Facebook groups, um, they're, they're like town halls, people are having conversations and they'll, but, you know, one of our best stories this year was about an, in, an invasion of king crabs, for example, um, which was basically um, a fisherman who'd been trawling off the coast, the Yorkshire coast, um, you know, he was worried about this specimen of crab that he was dragging in. He thought it was a killer crab from America or something. And um, once it was identified, it turned out to be native and, and all was well. But you know, that, that comes from just listening to, the, to social media. There, there are tools you can use as well, like CrowdTangle. So I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that will spike for you. That will tell you uh, in this place at this time, these people are talking about something. So why not just have a look? So you, you don't necessarily, you can, you can digitise your uh, radar, if you like, these days with the tools that are available to you. Um, Hootsuite's another one, um, but you can you can use the technology to listen for the quirkies for you. Now you don't have to spend all of your time. Although the, the nothing beats ringing your contacts and having a great network of contacts right around the county. Um, but that's as well as using the tools that are available to you now. It's not an instead of. Um, it, it's it's an as well as, um, but. Again, uh, one thing my first editor told me, um, just open your eyes and look around you. That's the best thing you can do. And he used to say to me, if, you know, as no journalist should ever walk past a planning application that's taped to a lamppost, because that planning application will be a great story for the people who live near that lamppost. Good advice. Um, there was a question here, and then I'll come, I'll, I'll come to you in just a second, sorry. Oh, if you've got the mic, why don't you just go in? <laughs> Thank okay. you. Sorry. I've just got um, questions coming through from online. So we have okay. a question from Karis, who asks, with pay being low in regional journalism, what can you do to overcome lack of diversity in the newsroom? Okay. James, do you want to start with that? Um, it's a challenge. I mean, I understand I can all fart here, but my first salary 20 years ago, um, as I say, in October was £8,000 a year. That was my first salary. Um, I think for a 
a senior now, the, uh, the average in a local newspaper would be between 20 and 25. You know, you, you're not going to end up driving Ferraris if you write in you know, local journalism. Um, I don't necessarily believe that the diversity of the newsroom is linked to pay directly. Um, I think editors, publishers have to be more proactive about building newsrooms that reflect the communities they serve. But I'll give you an example, and it's much publicised because I, I moaned about it and de deliberately put a mischievous tweet out about having, uh, I don't have a single female sports writer on the Yorkshire Post team, um, but nor do I have a budget to just go and get five female sports writers. You have to, it's almost dead man's shoes in sport, you have to wait for some bugger to die before you can give their job away. Um, and, and I've got, um, I'm lucky to have a brilliant sports team with people who um, get paid essentially for their hobby. You know, they love football, they love rugby league, they love ice hockey. Why would they leave that job? You know, so um, turning the, cranking the wheel of, of the newsroom and changing the people um, isn't always easy. You know, you, you don't want to throw, throw good people out of the newsroom. You know, you, you've got to, you've got to make way for, uh, for uh, you know, the, the right diversity, and as I say, newsroom that reflects the community it serves. Um, but there are, um, I won't bore people, but there are mechanics and tools now in the recruitment process um, that make it uh, much, much better for, um, you know, easier to identify people based on their talent rather than allowing those subconscious biases to influence who you recruit. Rachel, I know you work as a volunteer, so this is a slightly tricky one for you, but, but what are your thoughts on sort of how to get a diverse group of people together in the work that you're doing? It's always been a core belief of ours, really, to work with different voices. And I think what... Um, I was thinking about the film that we made with John DeMoco and now uh, Black Lives Matter in Doncaster featured in that heavily, which was started by... Um, Olivia Jones, who's um, it was a first time organising anything, and from the back of it, she's become an activist. And we use some of our Patreon to pay Liv, Liv to be a writer in residence for us because Liv's perspective was so important. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't, Liv needed to write her experience. So we'd use some of the Patreon money, which wasn't very much, but to just pay a small amount. But for some of the other writers that we've worked with, that small amount's then led on to other other things and, and I'm standing down from Doncopolitan and Liv's going to um, um, run Doncopolitan so it's been kind of a really nice trajectory even though it's been a small kind of um, thing just getting paid to write a piece for a year but it's, mm. it's something um, so that's what we've done as a small That's, that's good to hear, thank you. Let, let's go to the, to the gentleman there who's been waiting quite patiently for a long time. <laughs> This leads on from much of what you've been saying, but we've been hearing about the dangers of clickbait and things like that, and I just wanted to hear more about the opportunities that um, new media offered for journalism today. Okay, Roger. Uh, I'm a bit of kind of old-fashioned, I'm afraid, when it comes to, to journalism, I'm a bit, a bit of a dinosaur. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned, interview people, write it. Um, the things that James was mentioning, the you know, they're doing videos and things. Um, I mean, obviously, it's great for websites. I mean, I, one thing I do worry about is, um, will that kind of close off chances for people who might not be that kind of outgoing and exuberant? You know, the, the worry that if you can't do a piece to camera, then you, will you still have a future in journalism if you're not that kind of person? I think I hope will always be a place for people who are kind of just quiet and good listeners, good, um, good interviewers, good writers. Um, on a tech front, I'm not uh, particularly hot on that myself, so, sorry. Old school, we like that. Rachel. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we look at how people are using um, different um, platforms to tell stories and we want to expand and move into using TikTok and video more. We have experimented over the years but it's definitely we feel we need to do that 
um, and a lot of people are telling their own stories on those platforms so it's like understanding how we can expand our team and and bring more people in to, to, to use that as a platform so um, okay thanks Can I just say embrace new media um, every opportunity that technology gives you to tell a story learn how to use it and use it to tell your stories that storytelling is as old as humankind isn't it and the way we tell stories changes every day you know I'll go into the office and somebody will ask me if I know about such and such and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about and, and I think um, new media is, is it presents great opportunities and um, I, you know I welcome people coming to the newsroom to who have those skills and the awareness of new media not least because if we go back to the last question about diversity um, if we're going to make our newsrooms appealing for people from all walks of life that we've got to tell their stories um, with people who they recognize who they can relate to in places that they want to consume the media if we just try to force them to read you know a newspaper that's only got pale white males who are 50 plus telling their stories um, we're on a glide path to oblivion we we have to diversify the types of story we tell and diversify the places where we tell them and I, and I think that will help to diversify the newsrooms because and people will see that it's a place that can represent them, that they can work for, that they would believe in. And I, I do think news brands, you, you're talking about, um, for, I think I'm being called off here, but um, a last sort of anecdote, when, when my MD, who's no longer with us, offered me the Yorkshire Post editorship, um, I turned it down. I, I said, I, I don't want to work for a, a right-wing newspaper. The Yorkshire Post was you know, once owned by conservative newspapers, PLC, um, and I said, I don't, you know, I don't want to write right versus left. I don't, I don't want to be, my journalism to be steered by politics. And he said to me, what do you want it to be steered by? I said, well, not right versus left. I want right versus wrong. That's what journalism's all about. And he said, well, go and do it then. And he gave me the reassurance that I needed that you know, I could change the Yorkshire Post. I was able to bring my influence to bear on the kind of stories it told. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that he did, because I think we need to do that. Okay. We haven't got very long left, but I think we've got some online questions. So I think this will be our last question. Okay. But it's, um, it's from Kat, and it, it follows on from that theme, which is um, how has your job had to change in terms of sharing news on social media and the fact that something can rapidly get taken uh, out of context mm. when you have such few characters in order to write a new story? Mm. Rachel, has that happened? I'm not, I'm not sure how I can answer that, really. Has, um, that hasn't happened to you? No, no. Lucky you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. James, I bet that's happened oh to you. Oh, God, every day. Um, <laughs> and it is because people want to bring their agenda to bear. You, um, hopefully you're all familiar with the boy on the hospital floor story. It was a story by uh, Dan Sheridan, who works for the Yorkshire Evening Post. It was his story. Um, the Yorkshire Post, we picked it up, published it and shared it. And, you know, um, it went viral. People were saying it was fake. It's, it didn't happen, despite the fact that the chief executive at the hospital, the lead clinician at the hospital, confirmed it was true. There was a little boy. There wasn't a bed for him. He slept on the floor on a pile of coats. That was our NHS at that time, doing its best, but overworked. Um, and I got a letter from a, from a lady called Margaret. She said she was cancelling her subscription to the Yorkshire Post. The Yorkshire Post had been on the coffee tables of her family for 75 years, three generations, and she was fed up of reading fake news published by journalists like me who just wanted to tell lies uh, and that's how quickly mm. truth can be destabilized by social media and what was it like in your newsroom at that point were you did you have conversations saying you know, how do we deal with this sort of backlash or did you have a sudden moment thinking oh god have we definitely because obviously you checked it out but did you think oh have we definitely definitely well, checked this the, the wave <clears> of um so there was thousands of bots came at my twitter account thousands of them saying that I'd got it wrong, that it, mm. it was fake news. Donald Trump was responsible for that fake news sort of bark that makes everybody go, oh, I don't really trust these guys. Yeah. Um, and you get a knot in your stomach. And I remember emailing Dan, the journalist who got the story, he's a great journalist, and he showed me he's working out. He should, mm. Still using the notepad, this is in my notepad, this is who I rang, this is who I spoke to. 
Um, and the quality of a shorthand note can't be underestimated when you're trying to defend something in a legal position or yeah. something that's as serious as that. Um, but you get a knot in your stomach, but that quickly goes away when the training and the professionalism of the journalist is presented to you. Um, the challenge then is to debunk the, fake, the fakery. Mm. Um, very, very difficult. And um, there was one that went viral on Facebook. Twitter's slightly different. That, that felt like Russian bots automated <coughs> to target my account. On Facebook, there was a lady who said, the Yorkshire Post story is definitely not true. I've got a friend who works uh, uh, at Leeds Hospital. Um, she, she told me that it's absolute nonsense. This is just a non-starter. Uh, and that went viral on Facebook. And mm. more people read that than read our story. Right. So that old mantra about you know, a lie gets halfway around the world before truth gets its boots on is, is very much true when it comes to mm. social media. Right, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there, although that's not a positive note to end on somehow. Um, the positive note is the exhibition, so if you haven't yet checked it out, please do, because there's some fantastic celebration of journalism in there. But thank you so much to all of you, James, Rachel and Roger, you're fantastic, really great insight into all the work you do and the difficulties of doing the work that you do, um, and it's been really great to hear from you, and thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you, everyone. Um, just a final note of thanks from me. I'm Maxime, and I work on the Living Knowledge Network. Uh, this event has been a real collaborative effort between the British Library, Leeds Libraries, and the Living Knowledge Network. And we are really proud of this exhibition, Breaking the News, which is now open in 31 public libraries around the UK. So if you head to our website, you can find out information about that. Um, we have, for people in the room, books at the back of the hall uh, so you can buy Fatima's and Roger's book so please do head back there and take a look um, but another round of applause for our amazing speakers thank you